so did, did Billy come to you and say, you know what, I want you to want it to work again, or, or how did the collaboration continue? Well, he called me up um, one day, and he said, I got a, I have a great piece for us to work on. Mm-hmm. And I said, what is it? And he described it, and he told me the story in his, in his words, and he said, it's from a book. And I was familiar with the book because uh, while I was working on, I was shooting Play It Again, Sam, in San Francisco, and my wife was reading the book. And every night when I come home from work, she was curled up in the middle of the living room floor reading this fascinating book, and she didn't even notice that I walked in half the time. Right. Um, and then when she told me the story, I said, what are you reading? And she, she told me the story, and my reaction was, oh, God, I hate stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and then when Billy called me, uh, and he he described the story, it was fascinating. And uh, he is a great storyteller. So... Um, I said, wow, that's terrific. So he suggested that I get the book and read it, which I did because we had it there. And I immediately read the book and fell in love with it. And in the meantime, he sent me the screenplay. And I read the screenplay and loved that. And um, the rest was history. And did, did either one of y'all or both of y'all, did y'all consider this a a horror film? Or did y'all consider this kind of a realistic-based story and having this kind of supernatural element or this this fantastical, horrific element coming into kind of a real-world setting? Well, we never never really discussed horror film at all or anything like that or, or, or our philosophies on what kind of film it was. What we decided to do as a look was to not shoot it like a horror film, and uh, we wanted to shoot it as something very natural and believable. That, that was the key to, I think, making it work, and he felt that way very strongly. The only way the audience is going to ever accept this and po- believe that it's possibly going to ha- is happening is if everything about it is believable. So mm-hmm. that was the look we went for. You know, certainly with certain moods to it, um, but that's all part of the storytelling. Right. And so the film's uh, color palette is very autumnal, you know, very wintry. Um, I'm just curious, did y'all film during the fall and, and winter of a year? or We filmed it in the fall, late late summer and fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And were there, uh, was there any edicts on colors that, uh, whether it be muted or heightened or certain colors not to be in the film or, or so forth? I don't remember if we discussed that in particular. Uh, in general, I know I like to stay away from bright colors and uh, more in earth tones. That was something that I generally felt like doing in my photography all the time. So we definitely leaned in that direction and, mm-hmm. and more more towards earth tones, I would say, and avoiding bright blues and reds and things like that. Now, there were splashes of, things, of, of color here and there, but uh, that was all part of the set design and the costume design and the production design and, and everything else, and it just all worked as a cohesive unit. I, I'm sure this was dictated by the story, but the opening sequence of the film, which did not take place in, in Georgetown, um, so that is, it, there's a lot of uh, harsh, bright sunlight and so forth, and so did that dictate that, well, that, those, that opening sequence was going to be, you know, the lighting obviously was not going to be that autumnal cool of Georgetown and just to kind of separate the two? Well, you know, naturally, just it it was shot in Iraq. So, and I did not do that portion of the film. That was shot afterwards, actually. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was actually, that was after we finished all of the work in in Georgetown and New York. um, And the studios were all in New York. Just some some locations, not all, but some locations in Georgetown. But most of the picture was done in New York. And um, the Iraq sequence was shot when we finished all of that uh, domestic footage, you might say. Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and naturally, the location itself called for that kind of a look, the bright sun and, and the, the desert heat look and everything else. Mm. At a certain point in the film, the, it, the action just kind of stays in this uh, the Linda Blair's uh, bedroom, Reagan's bedroom, and there's a lot, you know a lot of scenes in that in, in the in that setting. Was there an edict on? Well, we're going to be in this set, so let's try to you know keep it uh, you know try to be not shoot it the same way, or or was it just more the realist realistic approach was the overriding 
approach to, to, to those scenes? I think just, uh, as I said, the keeping it believable, that was the, that's the catch word, keeping everything believable. And by keeping something believable, you shoot so you don't draw attention to anything else, and you just feel like you're in the environment. You know, some people recently have said they thought of it like as a documentary kind of a look. I never thought of documentary at all, neither did Billy. We never used that word. Um, you know, the French Connection had closer to a documentary look, and even that, we didn't really shoot it like a documentary. But uh, The Exorcist, all we all we went for was believability and not drawing attention to itself. And unlike the French Connection, we did have we had a lot of moving uh cameras uh you know running you know following across you know characters running and so forth and you know that's where i guess kind of that documentary uh you know kind of comparison comes in uh but in the french connection uh i guess uh, i'm assuming one of the things was that we're going to keep the camera kind of uh locked in certain places because the camera's not it doesn't move as as much as i guess you'd say in the french connection would that be a fair assessment well <laughs> I find that funny because we never really thought of it in those terms either. Right. I mean, the camera, the movement of the camera is dictated by the staging, and how the actors move around, and the story that you want to tell. Mm-hmm. And by today's standards, the camera looks like it's locked and not moving much because the camera these days never stops. I mean, it's herky jerky time. But um we shot it a little bit more classically i would say and and um there's plenty of movement there's plenty of camera movement in the exorcist i mean i've been looking at it a lot in the last year so i'm familiar with every frame of it now and this the camera moves plenty uh all kinds of movement right. if you really sit and, and think about it and look at it you'll see that very rarely is the camera locked off Usually, whenever we hear about, you know, suspense films, horror films, particularly, uh, you know, what the audience says, you know, what the audience experiences is, you know, something very terrifying and unrelenting. But, you know, a lot of the, the stories that come out in the making of it, you know, they, they say, well, the, the the mood on the set is actually kind of lighter, joking or whatever to kind of eat, break the tension. But I'm curious, what was the mood like on this particular set, particularly with, obviously, someone like Billy Freakin? Head of you know in charge of everything. Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by particularly Billy Friedkin. Um, uh, the the mood and the set on The Exorcist varied. It was um, all over the place. In general, I'd say it was tense, right. um, very demanding. Billy was um, he was pardon my my expression, but he was possessed with making this. Um, something very special and that attitude permeated right down to the last person on the crew because he was very demanding on what he wanted and what he expected from everybody so that in itself creates a bit of tension now at the same time um there was a lot of lightheartedness also mm-hmm. uh, you could see it well you know one of the things you'll see on the blu-ray is you'll see this behind the scenes footage of how we shot everything mm-hmm. and um and that will, in itself, will give you some idea of. It probably would be a little misleading, and that makes it look like everything was lighthearted and happy. But there was a lot of diligent, intense, concentrated work by everyone on that film. What would you say? What, what do you remember was being the most difficult sequence to to come together as a cinematographer? Was there one sequence that was that really stuck out as kind of a, a challenge or a set piece for you? Well, the exorcism itself. I mean, that that you know that that whole scene took I don't remember how long it took, but it probably took two or three months to shoot. Really? And and because logistically it was very very difficult because of the fact that we had to see breath on the actors mm-hmm. and the set had to be refrigerated. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who once and for all consigned that roaring lion, hastened to our call for help, and snatched from ruination and from the clutches of the noonday devil, this human being made in your image and likeness. Strike terror, Lord, into the beast, now laying waste your image. 
Let your mighty hand cast him out of your servant, Reagan to raise McNeil. So he may no longer hold captive this person. We had huge refrigeration units working, air conditioning units, to cool the set down. And when you when you use air conditioners to cool something down, it also dehumidifies. And it's the humidity that allows you to see the breath. You could see breath at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but not if there's low humidity, you can't. And so by taking the humidity out of the air, we had to cool the set down to like 20 below zero. Billy likes to say it was 40 below zero. I don't ever remember it going that cold. But I can tell you that it was definitely 20 below zero in order to see the breath. And in, in order to get it that cold, these air conditioning units had to run. And it was so noisy that in, in order for us to work, we had to shut them off. And when we shut them off, the room would quickly warm up. I had to use very small lights, the smallest lights that were available to me at the time. Nowadays, you could use cooler lights, and, and that would help. But the lights then were all incandescent lights, and so um, they warm up naturally just on their own. And every time that would warm up just a few degrees, you wouldn't be able to see the breath, so we'd have to shut down, turn the air conditioners back on, everybody would leave the set, and we'd have to wait for it to cool off, and then come back in and shoot. And maybe we'd get a couple of takes on something, and then it would be too warm to see the breath, so we'd have to leave again. And that process is very, very time-consuming, you can imagine. Right. Well, uh, let me ask you about another sequence that, that you know, wasn't in the original theatrical cut, but then was in... Uh, the 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 director's cut or the version you've never seen cut as they like to call it. Uh, what do you remember of the infamous spider walk sequence? On well, the spider walk was really tricky to shoot because for her to come down the steps like that, and the only way we could do it, we did it with a stunt double um, for most of it, and and the only way to do that was on wires. And as, as good as I was at hiding the wires like I did in the levitation scene, because we used wires for that too, but I was able to hide them visually, we just couldn't quite hide them all the way from top to bottom in that spider walk. And so they didn't use it in the original version. Now with computer graphics, you're able to take the wires out. Right. So the fact they could take the wires out easily, they were able to put that scene back in. Mm-hmm. Just to go back a little, I'm curious, you know, because Billy was coming off of the, the French Connection, which had won Best Picture and, and and so forth, and Oscars and all that. You know, nowadays, you know, everyone always talks about whenever a director has a, you know, wins the Best Picture, Best Director, Oscar, and there's always talk about their next film, what they're going to do, and pressure. Was there, you know, back then in 72, when y'all were making this, 72, 73, was there talk about pressure on the follow-up to French Connection, or is that more of a new phenomenon? I don't know what you mean by pressure. Um, frankly, I, I, every picture is individual. Every movie stands on its own, and just because you may have won an Oscar or not won an Oscar or or had success with one or not had success with one, there's pressure on every film. Mm-hmm. I mean, every, every producer that makes a movie wants it to be successful, so there starts the pressure, and the studio's expect the same thing, and there starts that pressure. So there's always a great amount of pressure. Naturally, if you have um, a great body of work behind you, I guess a little more is expected of you. Mm -hmm. But nobody knows when you start out just how good or how successful or or how much of a failure uh, anything is going to be. Right. You know, there's a famous story that when uh, Kubrick was making The Shining and dealing with the the little boy, uh, Danny Lloyd, that he he hid the fact that they were making uh you know quote unquote a horror film from him, and so I'm curious on what was the uh the relationship on set of what Linda Blair had to enact was she aware of you know of what she was in of the kind of the extreme nature of some of these scenes and and the the full context of what she was being what she was a part of i guess of the exorcist. As far as I know, she was aware. I mean, she still was a 13-year-old girl, so however much a 13-year-old girl in those days could be aware of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody blatantly came out and said, you have to do a masturbation with a crucifix. You know know what that means, don't you? I mean, it wasn't that blatant or anything like that. She had a screenplay. Her mother had the screenplay. Um, 
they had the book. They knew what was going on, what the story was about. Uh, and she was an actress, and so she had the obligation to perform. And she did an amazing job, actually. Um, you, you know, for a 13-year-old girl to be able to do some of the things that she was able to do well, was fantastic. It was mm-hmm. uh, Everybody was amazed by her performance. But she could answer that question better than I could as far as... Right. <laughs> Let me ask you this. When the movie came out, were you surprised at the reaction the film got when it when it came out in 73, early, late 73, early 74, when it was becoming the talk of everything? Nobody knew how, just what a phenomenon it was going to turn out to be. I mean, even the studio heads, and I don't know this firsthand, but I've heard it from people that were witness to, to conversations. Even the studio heads at the time were walking out of a screening, one of the early screenings that they had, and they thought it was a bomb. They thought it was going to be a, a, a terrible flop. They had no idea. It wasn't until it went in front of a general audience that anybody realized just what an amazing picture it was. Mm-hmm. One of those things. Um you know, then once, of course, once the reaction started and people were vomiting and, you know, racing out of the theater and all those great stories that came out of it, then, of course, everybody jumped on the bandwagon and um, got involved with this great hit that they just made. I'm not going back in there. I have a friend in there alone, and I, I, I don't want to leave her in there alone. I'm not standing here shaking for nothing. <laughs> How about you? Uh, it's very, very real. I don't like it. I want to go home. I want to see if it's going to make me throw up. This is one of the most grossest movies uh, in the world. It is. I ain't never took my coat and hit it over my face <laughs> like that. This doesn't bother me that much. But I guess it bothers her more than it bothered me. Fantastic movie. It's really gross. Uh, it's really terrific. I've never in my life known a movie where people would faint. I mean, it's hard to make people faint. <laughs> They faint. I get up smelling salt. I can like the devil coming out of her. <laughs> <laughs> the second time we've seen it, we still can't have it. it makes my heart beat too fast. <laughs> oh, what do you think accounts for The Exorcist enduring, you know, almost 40 years later? Other, you know, other supernatural or horror films have also been hits, and then. You know, they kind of, uh, you know, they they're still appreciated, but their shock value or their or their ability to kind of wrap an audience, uh, you know, maybe dulls a little over time. But The Exorcist is still capable of really terrifying an audience. Well, you have to go back to the story. You have to go to the book. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a book that totally captivated the country, the whole world. Um, people were just fascinated and mesmerized by that book. I was one of them. And uh, so when you have something great like that to start with, and then the same person, William Peter Blatty, wrote the screenplay and adapted the book really well, um, that certainly helps to carry it forward. And then you get a director like Friedkin, who was so passionate about it and so such a perfectionist about everything that he was doing, while still nobody knew just how good it was going to be, at least when you have those ingredients going in, you have a pretty good chance of something sustaining. And the way we shot it, um, you could say that it's a, you definitely could say it's a classic. And the fact that we did it and made it believable that, too, is what holds up. I think a lot of the other great, what you call horror films or supernatural films, what happens is, unfortunately, people working on them have a tendency to reach a little further than what the actual words are, and they try to enhance it, shall we say, or over-enhance it and stretch it a little bit further than what the imagination can accept. And once you take something like that and make it totally unbelievable or partially unbelievable, you're creating a weak link in it, even if it's just slightly unbelievable. That weak link ruins the whole thing as far as I'm concerned. You know the old expression, change is as strong as its weakest link. Right. And and I think that in The Exorcist, um, the 
aren't any weak links that I can recall. I think it all holds up. So with that in mind, it's going to hold up over time. I think it's going to be a film classic 100 years from now. Right. Well, um, to wrap this up and, and bring it into the present, and because uh, our most, I guess, our most infamous or uh, noted conversation, probably the the show that I'm most known for in some circles, is uh, regarding the French Connection Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one of the things that came out of that when that when that aired and, and talking about that transfer, people were wondering what uh, what uh, Billy was going to do with the Exorcist coming on Blu-ray and so forth. Um, so your involvement on this transfer, uh, you actually were involved on this transfer from, from beginning. And I guess the first question I'll ask is, uh, was your involvement on, on this transfer, was that an edict of, uh, Warner Home Video, who, and that's out of their policy, or because of what the French Connection, uh, Blu-ray, they didn't want, they didn't want that kind of, uh, controversy or uproar or whatever, however you want to characterize what happened with that Blu-ray? Well, I mean, it's a multifaceted thing. First of all, uh, Warner Home Video didn't send down any edicts or anything like that. This is strictly Billy. When the that whole thing happened with the French Connection, he called me up afterwards and he apologized for not involving me in it and for the way it turned out. And we never were able to solve it. Uh, we both looked into it uh, very thoroughly and we were not able to find out where it went wrong because I saw the master that the Blu-ray was created from, and the master looked pretty good. I mean, there were things in it that I wouldn't have done, but, but overall it looked acceptable. Somewhere along the line, the process, that Blu-ray got damaged. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know at what stage it went wrong, but it went wrong. So Billy called me up, and he asked me if then, within the same breath, if I would like to get involved with The um, Exorcist, and I said, of course. And so I went in from day one, and the two of us sat and did all the timing, supervised it together. Mm -hmm. And there were times where he, he had to leave town for a few weeks to work on something. Then I would do it, and then he'd come back, and he'd get involved again. And we carried it right through to screening every single phase of it, the digital cinema, the Blu-ray, and approving it all the way right to the very end, both of us. Uh, well, two questions I'll ask. Uh, and, and I want to add too that, and, and Warner Home Video, they turn out great Blu-rays. And uh, the guy that's their archivist, Ned Price, is extremely diligent about making sure that anything that they turn out is going to be first rate. So I have never heard about one Blu-ray that's come out of Warner Home Video that wasn't up to 100% up to snuff or more. And that's the way the, the uh, Exorcist is too. Uh, absolutely. Well, the, uh, two questions. Um, one, on this, when, when you got involved in this, uh, the, the, the transfer and the exorcist for Blu-ray, uh, did, did you all use that uh, process that Billy, you know, was using for French Connection, and did you all bring it in at time, or was this uh, just a totally new, new collaboration, a new working uh, relationship on the transfer of the exorcist? No, what we did was we did the all but two scenes we did normally, the way you'd normally do a Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. And on two scenes, we decided there was one scene where we just couldn't get the color right. Um, there was something about it, couldn't get it. So I decided to try that same process again because I thought by desaturating the color a little bit, it might help it. And it did. It worked perfectly. And then the other scene was the exorcist itself, the ex exorcism itself. Uh, we felt that we wanted to cool it off more than we had it in the actual film, the original film, and just to give it an even colder look and to desaturate it a little bit more. And so for those things, it worked. But again, somewhere along the line in the process for the French Connection, something went wrong. In this case, even though we did this little different uh, approach for those two scenes, nothing varied. They were all followed through from beginning to end to make sure the quality held up. We didn't get any of that crazy grain or contrast or brightness or any of that, that bad stuff that happened on the French Connection disc. So uh, we're very happy with the results. I think the Blu-ray is as good as I've ever seen the picture look, and the digital cinema print that we've seen screened was as, as 
better than I've ever seen it look. So the, the other question I'll ask: uh, this 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 transferring process, I, and I assume this, but just so you can clarify anything that needs to be clarified, was this done for obviously for both versions? Uh, whatever was done for one version was done for the other, as far as I know. Okay. Everything was everything was done the same, I believe. So there, no one is going to be surprised on a quality difference on whether it's the theatrical cut or this, you know, the 2000 director's cut. It'll be the. the I have, I don't see any reason why there would be because it's okay. the same same approach to everything. Same colorist was involved. Um, same companies, same supervision, all the way. And um, I'll just ask you this on just your own personal, on an artistic level. Do you have a preference on either version? Oh, it's hard to say. I I like the original version, I, but I, I do like one scene in particular in the extended cut, and that's the end scene with uh, Lee J. Cobb and the priest. Mm -hmm. um, I like that ending. But... Um, you know, the spider walk, um, I could care less about, but the audience seems to like it. Um, and there was a modification, I think. There had been a version in between there where there was a few more sub subliminal shots of the devil, for example, and I think they're taken out of this version. I think it went back to sort right. of the top in-between version. Mm -hmm. But they're basically the same. I mean, there's a few other things in it, but... but you know, uh, you you always talk about The Exorcist as as an exploration of the mystery of faith, as you just have. But I'm wondering, as as your you've lived your life since The Exorcist, and and your faith and understanding of things has evolved. Do you think, if you were to make The Exorcist today, that you would have made it in any way different, Lee? You couldn't make The Exorcist today the way I made it. It would have to be. Ludicrous, the way all of these exorcist sequels and ripoffs have been. Mm -hmm. You know, they you'd have to escalate all the special effects. It would all have to be so wildly supernatural and without any kind of realistic base to to even get considered today. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you could even though the film, as you probably know, remains enormously popular and is continuing to be seen by, you know, vast hordes of people all over the world. One of the reasons for that is we, we've, with Warner Brothers, we've kept it alive. You know, we, we've made versions of the film that look like the film was made yesterday. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing dated about it. But the idea of the story itself, the way Blatty wrote it, and and the way I interpreted it. No, you couldn't do that today. It would have to be, you know, complete bullshit, mm -hmm. which is what these films are. They, they are not made by people who uh, are, are exploring uh, uh, the, the idea of, of, of a faith-based society. They're just made to, to rip people off and, and sell tickets. You couldn't make it today, no. I, I don't think you could either. But but what interests me, what interests me is 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 a director such as yourself, your relationship with your previous work. Because I, I suppose one way to look at it would be, I look at the, you look at The Exorcist and you think that's where I was at that point of my life. That's like a marker of who I was then. Do you feel that your? Do you still feel that you completely relate to? The William Friedkin that made The Exorcist at that time? Are you still in that same place? Oh, sure. You know, I, I mean, that that's an omega point uh, of a story like The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it it isn't something that once you reach that point, you you then back away or or transcend it. No, my interests remain the same. Um, I, I believe, because I know so much about the actual case on which this film is based, I know that something happened in that case that was either, um, how, how can I put this, it was either mass hallucination or something transcendent that occurred. Mm -hmm. there were, in the 20th century, there were only three cases uh, known 
that the Catholic Church had authenticated as demonic possession in this country. Now, today around the world, you have guys who claim to be exorcists or priests or whatever, and many of them do two or three exorcisms before breakfast, you know? <laughs> and there's a guy in the Vatican who is the Vatican's official exorcist. His name is Father Gabriel Amorth, A-M-O-R-T-H. And he claims to have done thousands of exorcisms. And to me, he just gives exorcism a bad name. I think there were very few. I think in our time, I think to a great extent, obviously I wasn't around uh, during the 1949 case, but possibly there are other solutions to the affliction of that young man then who was 14 years old. He's still alive today with no memory of what happened to him. And, uh, you know, the church through the uh, Jesuit diocese in, in the Washington area still keeps an eye on him because he lives back in that area. And uh, clearly, from my reading of the files of the case, which were given to me by uh, the pres uh, Father Henley, who was the president of Georgetown, Father Robert Henley. Um, one day he sat me down and let me read the files, which included the diaries of the doctors and the nurses as well as the priests who were involved in that case. And it was clear to me that something transcendent had occurred. And I don't know whether you ever saw the... Washington Post front page article about that case in 1949. Have you ever seen that? I haven't, no. You can Google it. It's out there. It's written by a reporter who was on the Washington Post called Bill Brinkley. It's a front page article that runs for a, almost, I think, over two full pages. And it describes this incident in 1949 in the Silver Spring, Maryland area, which Brinkley refers to as uh, a case of demonic possession that was in fact cured by uh, the, this lengthy exorcism as performed by the church. And it, it's very rare to see something like that given credibility on the front page of a major uh, American newspaper. You know, that wasn't the Inquirer. Bill Brinkley later went on and became a very successful novelist. He wrote uh, a comic novel called Don't Go Near the Water, which became a film. Uh, but all laid out in this newspaper on the front page, the upper left-hand column is where it starts with a big headline, is a description of that case. Wow. And that and the diaries and other things that I've been privy to have conv you know have deepened my my faith but I, I don't have any ultimate conclusions because i i'm not catholic i i believe that the organi organized religion is basically pretty far from the teachings of jesus mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know i i mentioned a guy who walked around in 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 a robe and sandals and now you see you know the, the the fathers of of the church wearing costumes and you know gold plated uh, uh, silver. You know they eat off um, fine china and they drink great wine and they own banks and they own real estate and and it looks like a lot of dress up. You know and it it's just not what I perceive as the teachings of Jesus. 